Please note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. As Laurie said, I am Ray Brocky, the manager of fire service relations for the American Wood Council. Prior to that, I was uh, in the Baltimore City Fire Department for, I don't know, oh, there we go, the screen's popping up. For uh, over 20 years, I was uh, in the Baltimore City Fire Department. I was a deputy fire chief and the fire marshal for the city. I retired as the assistant fire chief. But prior to that, I was a one scene fire investigator for the city for several years before I actually was in charge of the unit. I'm a certified fire investigator, and I also testify as an expert witness in uh, several arson trials, as well as civil trials. And I'm a licensed attorney in Maryland. That's relevant because I'm going to talk about some expert testimony stuff uh, on one of the slides. These are just the disclaimers that Lori talked to you about. So why was this course created? Basically, I was uh, had a, a chat with a fire marshal friend of mine who was lamenting the fact that his investigators didn't have the kind of knowledge on building construction, especially wood building construction, as uh, folks did in the past. You know, if you know anything about the culture of the fire service, years ago, most firefighters had side jobs. Many were contractors, carpenters, tradespeople, and they had you know knowledge of uh, framing terminology and types of construction and construction methods uh, from their outside job that they brought with them in the fire service. Well, nowadays, uh, a lot of folks in the fire service, they don't have that expertise. And it's it's not just simply the fire service, the culture at large uh, is lacking sufficient numbers of tradespeople. So he said, uh, I really could use a class just on wood construction, uh, just a, a basic kind of class that, 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 and things that the fire investigator would want to know about wood construction. So today we're going to talk about uh, basic uh, fire investigation. Basically, uh, I'm lagging here, so forgive the slide. I'm not sure what the problem is. Here we go. We're going to talk about fire investigation, uh, investigation basics. You know, things uh, about the systematic approach. You, you know, while many of the folks on this call, this might seem very elementary, I can tell you uh, that it, you can never hear it enough because it's going to be asked of you uh, when you get to court uh, to, see, to test your knowledge on investigation and your approach and your methodology. We're going to identify the build different types of construction. Um, we're going to focus in on wood construction methods especially. Uh, we're going to look at the residential building code or the uh, the IRC, the, the International Residential Code. We're going to discuss specific code requirements that uh, if there's a violation of these code requirements, it could result in rapid fire spread or or failure quicker than what it should be. Also, it could lead to uh, unusual fire patterns that could be confusing to the fire investigator. And then we're just going to talk about the fire performance of wood products. <clears throat> and we're going to finish up with a little case study uh, of a uh, fire investigation and, and talk about the value of the unburned room. All right, let's go ahead and close and share the results. So we've got a pretty diverse group today, Ray. Uh, we've got 42% of our attendees are engineers, 30% are code officials, 18% are fire service professionals, 5% architects, and 6% others. So thank you everybody for okay. attending and joining us today. You know, that's interesting. Okay, I uh, so we're going to cover <clears throat> the systematic approach I talked about. Uh, I'm just waiting for the outline to pop up here. You're good. It's it's on there. Okay, uh, I already talked about the uh, the outline. So let's move on to uh, fire investigation basics. This is what your fire investigator should be doing on the fire ground in the wake of a fire. It's pretty much laid out in 921. NFPA 921 is the Guide for Fire and Explosive Investigations, uh, affectionately known as the Bible of Fire Investigation. And basically, uh, it lays out how 
fire should be investigated. The basic methodology of fire investigation should rely on the use of a systematic approach and attention to all relevant details. It's important to know this language. It's important uh, for a lot of reasons. One is if you are called on the stand as an expert witness, you will be subject to the Dalbert standard. That's Dalbert versus Dale Chemical. It is the standard for all expert witness testimony. It uh, moved on from a standard that was known as the Fry standard. It started in federal court, but has been adopted by local states. In fact, my own state of Maryland just went to the Dalbert standard last year. It's to determine the admissibility of expert witness testimony. Under the Dalbert standard, the trial judge serves as the gatekeeper who determines whether an expert's evidence is deemed reputable and relevant. And this is any expert witness testimony. This is not just fire investigation. So under the Dalbert standard, the factors that may be considered in determining whether the methodology is valid is whether the theory or technique in question can be and has been tested, whether it has been subjected to peer review and publication, its known or potential error rate is, is, is uh, laid out, the existence and maintenance of a standard controlling its operation, this would be the standard 921, and whether it has attracted widespread acceptance within a relevant scientific community. Generally, the difference between the Daubert and Fry standard is a broadened approach to uh, of the latter. The, uh, the Fry standard just says you have to be competent and your opinion has to be generally, has to be uh, formed by generally accepted relevant scientific uh, uh, peers. Uh, but Daubert all offers that list. So if I were an attorney examining uh, a, a fire investigator to try to get him throw him or her thrown out as an expert, and then that would really limit their testimony. I would ask them basic question: What is your methodology? And and it, the best thing is to basically throw back at the attorney the the language you see here. And the systematic approach is the scientific method. And you know I've seen it ask before on the stand and you'd be surprised how many fire investigators actually uh, don't know or can't recall the science, the seven steps, you know, you said you use a scientific method. Well, you know, how many steps are in it? Seven. What are they? Well, here they are. Recognize the need to find the problem, collect data, analyze data, develop a hypothesis, test the hypothesis. hypothesis. If it doesn't test correctly, you form a new hypothesis, and then you finally select the final hypothesis. And if you can't, then it has to be deemed as an undetermined fire. Um, so we're just gonna go into types of building construction. And why is that important? Why is building construction important? Well, if we go to the professional standard for uh, fire investigators, which is NFPA 1033, it tells you why it's important. In, in your scene examination, you have to include inspecting and evaluating the fire scene, the types of building construction and effects on fi fire on construction materials. These are things you have to, uh, to know. That's why it's important. It requires a knowledge of building construction in surveying the interior and exterior of the fire scene, interpreting fire patterns and how buildings performed uh, how building systems performed, like say the fire barriers for our walls. So for a lot of you, this is gonna be very basic information, but like I said, I'm going to assume nothing. I'm, I'm not gonna assume the, the building or technical literacy of, of any fire investigator. So there's five types of building construction. There's type one, which is non-combustible, type two, which is also non-combustible, uh, but it, it is unprotected. Uh, type three, where the exterior walls are non-combustible material, but the interior building elements are framed down in wood or any material allowed by the code, but mainly wood. Uh, type four, heavier mass timber. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that type because it's new type of construction. And then the, the probably the most prevalent uh, type of construction out there, which would be type five for new construction anyway, which is basically any materials permitted by the code, but usually it means like frame wood. So just to go through the, each type of construction briefly, I'm waiting for the slide to boot up. I don't know about this delay. 
You're good, Ray. Okay, so we have type 1A and 1B. And the only real difference between 1A and 1B, they're both going to be steel or concrete, you know, something non-combustible, is the fire resistance rating of the structural frame, the bearing walls, the roofs, etc. Uh, then we have type 2A and 2B, which once again are non-combustible steel and concrete, but they also uh, have a lesser fire resistance rating on the structural frame, bearing walls, roof and floor than you see in type 1 A and B. We move on to type 3, which is ordinary construction, which is the most common type of construction. Uh, it's identified by masonry brick exterior walls, non-combustible walls with wood joists, interior structural components, very common in one and two family dwellings. You can use fire retardant treated wood complying with uh, IBC section 2303.2, which uh, it'll be permitted within exterior wall assemblies of two hour rating or less. Probably most of your homes are built out, especially if you have had a home for a while, it's probably built out of type three and a lot of older communities, you'll see that. Now type four, which it used to be simply type four, uh, now we have type 4A, type 4B, type 4C, and type 4HT. The old type 4 has now, in the wake of the 2021 IBC, uh, it's been broken up into four different building types. The traditional type 4 construction is now called type 4HT, which is just to, to denote it from type 4A, B, and C. It's what you, it's traditional heavy timber, it's mill construction. Now you have type 4A, type 4B, and type 4C, which is mass timbers. It's very, very different from type 5 that I'm going to talk about in a second. The fire resistance and the way it performs in a fire is very different than in type 5. You have large um, uh, panels, panelized construction for the most part. You have cross-laminated timber panels that can be up to 7, H, uh, seven or 8 inches thick. 20 feet wide, 40 or 60 feet long, fabricated off-site, brought on-site, supported by glue lamb beams and columns. Um, and uh, it, depending on which type of construction, type 4A can go as high as 18 stories, and it's fully encapsulated and usually gypsum wallboard. Type 4B can go as high as 12 stories, and that's partially encapsulated. You can expose some of it. And then type 4C can go as high as nine stories, and you can have the mass timber on the inside fully exposed. But I do a whole <laughs> two hour class on that. So I can talk about that all day. And if anybody's interested, uh, just contact me. So then we move on to type five, which is light frame construction. And per the IBC definition, it's a type of construction whose vertical and horizontal structural elements are primarily formed by a series of repetitive wood or cold form steel framing members. So it could be steel. A lot of times people always associate type five with only uh, wood, but uh, it is also cold form steel frame members as well. And this will lead us to our first, or our second poll question, but the first one where you actually have to come up with an answer, which is type blank and blank building construction are non-combustible. So, 84%, the vast majority said types one and two. So uh, a handful of folks said the other answers. So let's hope that, let's hope that it's D there. Okay. And the answer is the one and two type of construction. One and two are non-combustible. So let's just focus in on wood construction. We're talking about platform, balloon frame, plank and beam, and heavy timber. So, and the fire investigator, according to 921, the Guide for Fire and Explosive Investigations, the fire inspector, investigator, pardon me, should obtain the building construction classifications and descriptions that are part of a particular building code that is enforced in which the fire occurred and should use them as a part of scene documentation. Along with that, the investigator should document the type of construction by looking at the main structural elements. 
So it is a requirement, or even though this is a guide, let me tell you, in court, this is uh, deemed required behavior. So even though they say it's a guide, it, it's in court, it's treated like gospel. So the first type of construction we're going to look at, which is the most common type of construction for residential buildings, uh, residential construction rather, is platform, sometimes called Western platform. Uh, basically, platforms or floors are built as construction is built. It inherently provides fire barriers, barriers to vertical fire travel as a result of the uh, configuration of the stud channels. Vertical openings for utilities may provide a passage for fire to upper floors, though. And uh, one consideration is, in addition to combustible construction, it has concealed spaces in soffits and other areas for fire spread that can go undetected. Like I said, uh, it is considered uh, the most popular type of construction used in home building today. It provides a work surface for each floor level and is readily adapted to various methods of prefabrication. So this is just uh, a platform construction, the constructed wall, we see the wall studs, you see the headers over doors and windows. The sole plate of the wall is fastened through the subfloor into the framing beneath. Uh, platform construction provides a structural frame that is fire blocked by the virtue of the style of construction. The, <clears throat> the, the wall sole plates and the top plates isolate the horizontal floor cavity from the vertical wall cavity as required by the building codes. So there is inherent fire blocking in platform frame construction. This is in uh, this is very different than an older type of construction known as balloon framing. I sometimes hear fire service folks sort of mix up. They think any kind of light frame wood structure is balloon framing and uh, that's not true. This is a, a type of construction where the studs go from the foundation right up to the roof line. Uh, floor joists are connected using ribbon board. Uh, the, it's a, basically an open channel from the, from the foundation right up to the roof uh, for fire. The result may be recognized by, uh, this result may be recognized by the attic fire that consumes the top portion of a structure while the fire really originated at some lower point. You know, there could be extensive burning at the upper level, even though the fire uh, originated in a lower level. Um, the second floor joists bear on a minimum one by four inch ribbon strip, uh, which has been let into the inside edges of the exterior wall studs. So, so the, the uh, requirement for longer studs and the difficulty in accommodating current, current erection practices and fire blocking has reduced, if not eliminated, the popularity of the system. I mean, you just don't see two by fours long enough anymore. It's uh, harder to build. There's extensive fire blocking that has to be put in. So basically, this type of construction really ceased to exist for the most part after World War II. So if you're an older community prior to World War II, you, you, you be mindful that this construction is out there. But after World War II, if it was built in your community, chances are it's platform construction. The next type is a little less common, the plank and beam construction listed in NFPA 921 7.3.2.3, which basically large beams replace many smaller wood members. The beams are farther apart. The decking for floors and roofs are of a minimum thickness as opposed to plywood. Um, you have a, a limited amount of concealed spaces, which is nice. The plank and beam construction or framing is a type of framing with no joists, but widely spaced beams spanned by heavy plank. This method uh, was developed in the early 19th century for industrial mill floors, uh, but also may be found in timber framed roofs. So in addition to plank and beam, we also have post and frame construction. Post uh, frame, uh, post and frame construction refers to a highly engineered wood frame building that can be built with a variety of exteriors. Buildings can be built uh, on concrete columns in the ground, columns mounted on a monolithic slab or over a basement. But this would be an example of a pole barn. 
the next type of construction. And as soon as the And this is my slide catches up here. Heavy timber. Now, uh, NFPA defines heavy timber construction as a system having main framing members measuring no less than eight inches by eight inches with an exterior wall that is made of a non combustible material. So that's that old uh, mill construction that we've talked about. There's no concealed combustible spaces. You have exterior walls that are non combustible using masonry or brick. And then we move on to mass timber, which I've talked about, which is a uh, large panelized construction. Here you see CLT slabs, cross laminated timber slabs being supported by glue lamp posts and beam columns. There are no combustible concealed spaces, but they do have concealed spaces. Uh, like I said, I do a two hour course on mass timber construction by itself. It's uh, brand new to the building code. It's the first time in the modern building code that three new construction types were ever added uh, to the building code. So it's it's really interesting. These are being built and proposed all over the country. There's one in Cleveland that has gone vertical. It's gonna be nine stories. There's one in uh, Milwaukee that's being built that will be as high as 26 stories. And that leads us to poll question number three. The most common residential construction type is? Close it and share the results. So another overwhelming majority, the most folks, 83% said platform framing, choice B. 10% said none of the above. And then a few folks said balloon framing and mass timber as well. So let's hide that and Ray, you can talk about the answer. Okay, well, the majority of folks got it right. It is platform framing, as indicated by the underlining of B. So I just wanted to talk a little bit. I don't think investigators put enough time in uh, really looking at residential code violations that potentially existed in the houses they investigate. They're very consumed and rightly so with the origin and cause, um, but also as part of a, a good solid uh, investigation report, you, you should be documenting the uh, code violations, if any, that you see. And 921 even talks about that. There, are, there may be numerous codes to analyze in order to perform a thorough evaluation at a minimum the building code, fire prevention code, and property maintenance code should be reviewed. The building code that was in effect when the building permit was pulled to construct the structure is on the permit. So basically, we all know that if you had pull permit, they always put what addition to the code it was built under. This is where the investigator might have to get some help from the building inspector or the building department and uh, do a, a code analysis, if they can, of the place. <clears throat> and the majority of structure fires in this country are one and two family dwellings. They are governed by the International Residential Code. Of course, if you had a commercial property, it would go to the International Building Code. And I just have a slide here that shows you the scope of the International Residential Code. So it applies to construction, alteration, movement, enlargement, replacement, all of one and two family dwellings and townhouses, not more than three stories in height. And for the fire service folks that maybe don't have a great background in the codes, if you notice the italicized words, it's not a mistake. Anytime you're looking at a code and you see words italicized in a code section, it denotes the fact that the word is a defined term within the codes. And you'd probably be well served to go back in chapter two and look at the definitions. So the first um, code, uh, IRC code violation that uh, investigators should note when they are doing their scene evaluation or scene size up is the uh, provisions for fire blocking and draft stopping. For a long time, what the code now calls fire blocking was called fire stopping. However, the materials which provide annular protection around pipes and ducts are generally referred to as fire stopping. Uh, so the application that we will talk about here uh, it eventually became fire blocking. Now, fire blocking and draft stop stopping have similar but slightly different purposes. As you see here, 
fire blocking is intended to resist the movement of flames where draft stopping is intended to resist the passage of smoke and gas. But both are really, both of them are there to address the movement of smoke and gas. Uh, just one does it vertically and the other one does it horizontally. Um, so fire blocking is a material installed to prevent the spread of fire within or between vertical and horizontal spaces. So as soon as my slide boots up, you're gonna see a little diagram that shows you where fire blocking would be. So in a stud cavity, you'd have fire block. Draft stopping is a material installed to divide hollow floor and roof assemblies into multiple compartments, because we know that um, compartmentalization is really effective uh, in regards to uh, passive fire protection. So fire blocking and platform construction is inherent just because of the top and bottom plates, the way the walls are framed. Um, building codes typically, typically require fire blocking in stud, sp stud spaces at ceiling and floor levels. Horizontal fire, fire, fire blocking is provided, uh, requires solid blocking of floor joists over points of support, in some cases at partitions. So the, the need for draft stopping in large concealed space has been recognized for many years. The requirement is based on the rationale that the integrity of the floor is more critical than that of the roof. Therefore, allowable open areas should be smaller within floor spaces than let's say attics. In residential construction, draft stopping is required at a thousand square foot intervals when there is usable space above and below the assembly. So if you see a truss that bears directly on the top plate, there's no additional um, draft stopping, uh, I'm sorry, fire stopping needed, the fire blocking needed. And if the truss is top cord bearing, you have to provide the, uh, the fire blocking. So here are some general locations. Fire blocking is intended to resist the upward movement of flame, smoke, and gas. Here you see the general location cited in the code as soon as the slide <laughs> boots up. Uh, we'll show some simple examples in a moment, although it must be admitted that a real life application, the code requirements may be more complex than our examples. So while studs typically provide built-in protection horizontally in the top and bottom plates do the same vertically, in high walls, fire blocking must be added to limit the vertical distance to 10 feet or less. So if you have any high walls, you need to have intermediate uh, fire blocking in, uh, in intervals of 10 feet. You don't want more than 10 foot of stud cavity. So these are the accepted materials that you can use. You'll notice that the acceptable fire blocking materials tend to be rather substantial since they're intended to inhibit the passage of fire as well as smoking gas. As we'll see in a moment, draft stop materials are lighter because they're intended to reduce the, uh, the horizontal spread of smoke and gases. So I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of locations where they have to be, where fire blocking has to be provided. And one uh, popular one, this was a violation I used to see all over the place when I, when I was, I actually, when I left the fire service, I became the chief building official for a little town called Rockville. So I used to go out sometimes and conduct inspections uh, at the top and bottom of stair stringers, they must be fire blocked, keeping fire in the floor, keeping fire from getting into the floor assemblies uh, and traveling between floors below stairs. Uh, it also prevents the fire in the stringers from getting into, like I said, the floor assemblies. Some older codes had more extensive requirements for fire blocking stairs than the IRC does, but you see the fire blocking at the top and bottom of the stud cavities and then also for the, the stringers. Now with draft stopping, there are some points to be made about draft stopping requirements. <clears throat> Just give it a second for the slides to catch up here. I have a, have a 30 second lag on these slides now for some reason. Where usable space is both above and below uh, concealed spaces is required, I told you. Um, if there is no usable space above an assembly, like an attic or below, like a crawl space, draft stopping isn't required. 
So it's only usable space above and below. The assembly isn't concealed if it's an open floor, say above a basement. Uh, it also isn't required, but there are other requirements I'm going to talk about. The traffic stopping is required. The thousand foot square foot limit applies, but the divided space must be approximately equal. For example, say a 1500 square foot floor ceiling assembly, you can have a thousand square feet on one side and a protect, you know, one side of the protection and 500 on the other side. Uh, you'd want that equal. You'd want that 750, 750. But the accepted materials, like I said, for traffic stopping, just aren't as hardy as for fire blocking. Uh, here, you'll note the acceptable draft stock materials are lighter material, materials than those required for fire blocking. However, it would seem logical that fire blocking materials could be used for draft stopping since they would resist the passage of fire. And I just want to show an example of draft stopping within a floor system. As soon as the slide pops up, you'll see a parallel cord truss uh, in a floor assembly, and you'll see the draft stopping added. Even though the ceiling finish is added to the bottom of the truss, the inside of the truss is open uh, to the passage of smoking gas. For that reason, draft stop material must be added, as you see here. Uh, as soon as the slide boots up here, we'll talk about holes in plates that must be fire blocked with an approved material to resist the passage of flame. This means that latex caulk or foam insulation, which would likely melt out rather quickly, wouldn't be accepted. And we're gonna talk more about that actual caulk and foam in our case study at the end of the presentation. Now we have another poll question. I think this is the fourth one. We have five all together. So we have one more. Mm -hmm. And this one basically says, fire blocking and draft spot stopping both prevent the movement of smoke and gases through concealed spaces, true or false? There are the results. And 86% said true and 14% said false. So Ray, you wanna talk about the answer? Sure, I said this one was a little tricky because they talked about draft stopping specifically uh, used to prevent the movement of smoke and gases through concealed spaces. And I said fire blocking was really to prevent the, uh, the flame spread. That's why the difference in materials. However, fire blocking is also designed to prevent the movement of smoke and gases. So they both are. So the, the answer is true. So while fire blocking is there to prevent flame, smoke and gas, draft stopping is really there just to prevent smoke and gas. So I want to talk about eye joists and some uh, lightweight frame for protection in the codes. So it, the first, um, in 2012 IRC, floor assemblies not required elsewhere on the code to be fire resistant rated shall be provided with a half inch gypsum wallboard membrane, five inch wood structural panel membrane or equivalent to the underside of the framing member. <clears throat> Why was this requirement put in? Uh, they also put in 2015 and 18 penetrations for openings for ducts, vents, electrical outlets, um, and luminaries and all this stuff. The openings, the penetrations were permitted, but you had to protect them with a half inch of jip board. Um, this was really born out of the concern the fire services had with eye joists, with parallel cord truss, with um, cold form steel. Uh, it's basically light frame wood systems on, that are exposed uh, under unfinished or in unfinished basements. So you have an unfinished basement, you have an exposed eye joist or parallel cord truss. So uh, UL research has showed that in fire situations, these fail much quicker than dimensional lumber. So the wood industry got together with the International Association of Firefighters and the Home Builders, and they got this requirement put in that basically says, if you have a uh, floor truss system or an eye joist system, or like I said, the cold form steel system, you have to protect it with one of these three, uh, one of these two things or an equivalent, a half inch gypsum wallboard, 
five bays uh, wood structural panel, and that is to protect it in the event of a fire. There are some exceptions to this. And uh, one exception is if you have sprinklers in those areas, you do not have to provide the gypsum wall board or wood structural panels because they feel that the sprinkler is enough protection in those areas and the the reason another reason is the way that home building trends have been and i want to talk about homes getting larger homes are getting more expensive so a way to cut costs in a large home is don't finish the basement that way the homeowner can move in use the basement for storage and then at some later date they could finish the basement if they so choose so it's really sort of a a, a marketing thing why the basements aren't finished in a lot of new homes uh, to, to make them more um, affordable. So if you have sprinklers, you do not need to protect the underside of the uh, floor system, the open floor system. You also don't need to protect it if the floor assembly is located directly over a crawl space not intended for storage or for the installation of fuel fired or electric power heating appliances. This is the second exception. So the first exception would be a sprinkler system. Second exception would be a uh, would be if it's over a crawl space not intended for storage. So as a fire investigator, if you see these floor systems, you want to see if it, if one of the exceptions were met, if it is not protected with a half inch wall board. Now, if the house was built prior to you know 2012, it wouldn't have been required. But uh, I would encourage building officials uh, to, uh, to check out energy code and IRC requirements if fuel fired appliances or even ductwork are located in an unconditioned crawl space. Uh, you know, the IRC has additional requirements for conditioned crawl spaces. So <clears throat> there is a third exception to the requirement to put gypsum board on the underneath of uh, open floor system. And that's it, if small portions of the floor assembly equal less than 80 square feet. See, the code requires, uh, it requires code approved fire blocking to separate the unprotected portion from the remainder of the floor assembly. So basically it allows for up to 80 square feet of unprotected area provided fire blocking is, uh, it, it basically surrounds that 80 square feet to protect it from the, the rest of the floor assembly. This, this exception is meant to cover small openings where things like utility pipes may penetrate the ceiling or where the area does not need to be carefully protected like in the case of a fire rated assembly. It allows for construction of con you know, congested areas where gypsum or wool, which structural panel may be difficult or impossible to install. <clears throat> and then, the last requirement or last exception to the gypsum wall board or wood structure, structural pattern requirement would be if the floor assembly is using dimensional lumber or structural composite lumber. Structural composite lumber would be LVL, it would be, um, it would be a PSL, parallel strand lumber, anything that has the minimum dimension of two by 10. So if you have a solid two by 10, then you do not need to protect it with just some wall board. I think one of the big myths out there is that somehow engineered or structural composite lumber fails or burns quicker than solid dimensional lumber. They burn at approximately the same rate. The reason why eye joists and parallel cord trusses fail quicker is because they don't have the mass of say a two by 10. The, uh, the web of a eye joist is probably only a half inch thick compared to a two by 10. So um, another uh, thing that I think fire investigators should look at in the IRC is section 602.6, which deals with notching and boring. Um, you know, studs and exterior walls and bearing partitions shall be permitted to be notched up to 25% of the width. Uh, studs and non-bearing partitions are 40%. Now I'm not expecting people to remember these numbers, but um, uh, they should keep in mind that there are requirements for how much you can notch and bore uh, wood studs and top and bottom plates. And this could cause 
a wall assembly and a bearing wall to uh, fail quicker in a fire. This also provides avenues for fire spread within a concealed space. Um, so now the exception to some of these, if you use a stud shoe, uh, where, where it's installed according to the manufacturer's recommendation, you can notch and bore uh, a little bit more, but you have to have that stud shoe there and they're, they're very noticeable. You're gonna see those right away. So in notching, and solid lumber should not exceed one sixth the depth of the member, should not be longer than one third of the depth of the member. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't notch out half of a two by ten. Uh, notches at the end of the member should not exceed one fourth the depth of the member. These are just a lot of requirements for for notching and drilling, and these are considerations. I, Everything here is just things that you should examine to see if they are a factor in fire spread or if they are a factor in the uh, failure of an assembly, say quicker than a, a lot of fire investigators move, you know, talk about a quick moving fire being indicative of arson. And I'm saying that sometimes you could have an accidental fire that moves quickly because of IRC violations. So notching and boring definitely uh, have an effect on fire spread and even failure of an assembly if they are not, not notched and bored correctly. We'll look at some real life examples of bad uh, boring and notching. This is just uh, sort of a quick reference guide and a visual display on, on how notching and boring should occur. Uh, you know, one of the functions of the top plate is to transfer the lateral forces to the wall and help prevent racking. You know, more on, uh, there's, there's probably more on this if you, you go into wall bracing. But for that reason, it's important for the continuity of the plate to be maintained. If it's necessary, it'll cut it. Uh, there's code requirements for that. And you can have metal spice plates of a minimum thickness and width, uh, nails on either side of the, the cut, the size and number of nails uh, has changed regularly since the initial edition of the IRC. Um, you know, what it doesn't say is how all these go together. The illustration is similar to what's in the code. Putting so many nails so close together may split the wood. Uh, it might be better if the strap were wide enough to span the cut in both uh, in both levels of the top plate and the nails distributed in a wider fashion. Or if the steel plate were longer, or the nails were a greater distance from each other. These are all things to consider. Uh, wood structural panels nailed across uh, the cut would accomplish the same thing and is accepted as an alternative to the strap even. So also not addressed is whether the top plate can be completely cut and how to compensate for that situation. Uh, another IRC uh, code requirement that should be looked at should be rescue openings, okay? Why this is important is part of your duties as a, as a fire investigator, especially in a fatal fire situation, is to explain why the victim couldn't self-rescue. And a code violation of R310 could be the reason. Uh, emergency escape or rescue openings shall open directly into a public way or to a yard or to a court that opens to a public way. That's a requirement. And, you know, where you have basements containing um, more, uh, one or more sleeping rooms. I mean, that, that that's where the downturn in the economy affects things when it comes to building, or the building code, the residential code. People move back home. There's no room for them. So they'll sleep in an attic or they'll sleep into a, in a basement and they don't have adequate uh, emergency escape opening or adequate egress. And if something were to happen, they can uh, be trapped. I actually had a situation one time where a fire started in a basement that had uh, only one way out of the basement and the fire was between uh, the girl sleeping in the basement and that stairway. It had a little window, but the window was probably six, five or six feet off the ground because it was a basement and it was at the very top of the wall. 
and uh, she had a broken foot and could not escape because of it. And that was, and I had to document, you know, that, that she had been sleeping in a place that did not have an adequate rescue opening. <clears throat> and the next slide coming up is going to just talk about the minimum opening requirements for an escape opening. You have to have a net clear opening of not less than 5.7 square feet. The net clear height shall not be less than 24 inches and the net clear width shall not be less than 20 inches. Um, and there is uh, where there's a window, where a window is provided as an emergency escape and rescue opening, it shall have a sill height of not less than 40, of not more rather, I'm sorry, not more than 44 inches. You can also check out section 311 in the IRC for means of egress. <clears throat> also the presence of bars, grills, covers, and screens uh, where bars, grills, covers, and screens, similar devices are placed over emergency escape openings, um, or they have window wells, uh, you have to have a releasable and removable from the inside uh, cage or bar system or grill. You can't use a tool or a key or any special knowledge or any kind of greater force. This is a challenge, challenge you face in urban areas where crime is high. Um, as a fire investigator, I had a fatal fire in East Baltimore, and uh, basically it was a window air conditioning unit that was built into a wood stud wall. It wasn't put in a window, and there was an electrical fault, so fire started in the wall cavity, and the first floor was a store. The second floor were the two occupants who lived above the store, and they had state-of-the-art cameras. They had bars on the windows, they had everything but a smoke alarm. And by the time they found uh, out there was a fire in their place, they were trapped uh, between the fire, the fire was, was between them and the only stairwell out and the windows were barred. They could not release. They were literally screwed into the masonry brick. Uh, firefighters had to, to get a K-12 saw to even saw through the bars and it was too late. Um, and it was because crime was high in that area and they were more worried about crime than they were about fire. And I documented the fact that they could not get out of the barred windows. I'm just gonna show you a couple examples of code violations. Now, some of these would affect maybe the uh, structural stability. So in an event of a fire, uh, if you notice anything wrong here, here we have a lack of nails and the connector is bent the wrong way. So they, they bent the connector around that top plate and they put one nail in it. <clears throat> so that's going to affect, you know, these connectors aren't meant to be bent and, and you, you want to fasten more than one nail to connect them together. In this example, we have the correct connector. It's the wrong application for it. Uh, it was field modified. The nail pattern is not used properly. It's using screws instead of nails. The wrong holes are used and the right uh, flange is bent upward. So that's not a good thing. Let's wait for the slides to catch up. In this one, we have the plate penetration. Somebody had uh, penetrated the top plate and it needs fire blocking. So they have a nailer plate on there, so you can't nail into that uh, pipe, but uh, they need to make sure that fire cannot go uh, through that uh, penetration. Now this is an example of a violation. The holes are too near the face of the stud. You can see it's almost, it's barely, uh, keeping the face of the wood on there. So in, in, in the one corner, you have the, the pipe take a 90 and actually uh, cut the stud completely. So you're not getting any structural stability out of that one. And like I said, fire just makes it worse. Everybody feels like, oh, only wood is affected by fire. Well, you know, steel is affected. By the, all building materials have a negative effect to the to the ravages of fire. You know, steel melts and fails and concrete spalls and wood chars and burns and 
Uh, on this code violation, at first glance, this appears to be in compliance with the code. However, <clears throat> it might be that these two pipes have effectively destroyed the continuity of the wood fiber in the stud by cutting out most of the wood fiber in the one section of the stud. And it looks like uh, as if the black pipe may also be too near to the uh, back face of the stud. Again, the strap doesn't compensate for those problems. I uh, noticed the scorching of the wood stud from the, the soldering of the copper pipe. So we had a couple issues going on there. So I do wanna talk a little bit about fire performance of wood products and also how changes in the housing stock and contents have affected uh, fire spread. <clears throat> so the home building industry is changing in, to, in response to resource constraints and market demands. So we have one of the uh, resource constraints is the availability of large diameter trees is on the decline. And then you have homeowners that are clamoring for larger homes with open uh, ceilings and larger rooms and average size of homes have gone up. If you look at the average size home in 1960, it was 1,200, a little over 1,200 feet. Then you go 1990, it goes up to 2,000 square feet. And now we're talking about 2,600 square feet. So, <clears throat> um, the also, another thing has changed is the, the materials that we're putting into our homes. You know, uh, UL has done this uh, on the modern versus legacy furnishings. Uh, they did a, uh, this is a silent six minute video. I'm gonna speed it up um, uh, when it gets to the good part. Uh, but basically it displays the fire behavior of legacy furnishings, wood and natural fiber compared to modern uh, synthetic products. Uh, uh, the UL experiment was conducted with two side-by-side -side living room fires. The purpose was to understand the difference between modern and legacy furnishings. And I'm gonna speed it along to about a minute 45, and hopefully it'll catch up on your screen. But the purpose was to understand the difference between modern and legacy furnishing. The rooms measured 12 by 12 with an eight foot ceiling and had an eight foot uh, wide by seven foot tall opening on the front wall. Both rooms contain similar amounts of furnishings. The modern uh, room was lined with a layer of half inch painted gypsum wall board and the floor was covered with carpeting and padding. The furnishings included a microfiber covered polyurethane uh, uh, foam filled sectional sofa, engineered wood coffee table, end table, television stand, and bookcase. The sofa had a polyester throw placed on the right side, and the end table had a lamp with a polyester shade on the top of it and a wicker basket inside of it. The coffee table had six color magazines on it, a television remote, a synthetic plant. The television, <clears throat> the television stand had a color magazine on it. There was a 37-inch flat panel television. And just look at the, uh, you know, at a right around uh, two and a half minutes, the modern room is, has a, has a fire that is starting to free burn while in the legacy room, it is just incipient. Uh, the right rear corner of the room had plastic toy bin, plastic toy tub, four stuffed uh, toys in it. So you can, uh, it both had a similar fire load though. And I don't know, the video is real choppy. Uh, you should go to the UL site to see. Well, anyway, long story short, let's try to get to about four minutes in, you'll see the room is in full flashover and in the legacy room, it's hardly even burning. And we're putting more and more furniture in these bigger and bigger places. And the heat release rate is higher. The fuel load is higher. So this was the results of the UL fire test. Time to flash over. 
and flashover being 600 degrees Celsius, one inch from the ceiling, or about 1130 some degrees Fahrenheit. If you look at the modern contents, it flashed over in three and a half minutes. And the legacy contents took almost a half hour. So if we look at fire department response times, the standards by NFPA, you know, even if we're talking about a great response, it was about six minutes, six to eight minutes, you, you're talking about rooms already post flashover and, and it's probably spread to other places. It's untenable for any living occupant in there where the legacy contents, you, you had a half hour to get there, get in there and, and put out the fire. So you just have less time. And this uh, has nothing to do with building construction. It has everything to do with contents. We did five ATF fire tests on mass timber construction down in the ATF labs in uh, Maryland. And it was consistent, the flashover times through all five tests, regardless of how much mass timber was exposed, because the contents of the rooms were identical. So you have identical rooms, you have almost identical flashover. So these are just the changes in residential construction and the effects by those changes. In recent decades, there have been a number of changes in residential markets in both construction practices and materials that affect fire behaviors. So some of these features include larger rooms and homes. We talked about it. The Wall Street Journal reported that um, that basically homes built in the 70s compared to homes built now are 77% bigger and increased over that period of time. Uh, more open floor plans. Similarly, you know, design elements have opted for open floor spaces that increase the amount of fuel and ventilation in a single compartment. You have increased fuel fire loads and contents. Furniture characteristics, as I talked about, have changed over time. Furniture that uh, used to be constructed of wood and natural fibers are now made of synthetic materials. So even though a lot of these home furnishings meet voluntary flammability standards, these pertain to surface ignition ca uh, characteristics, not to total combustion. So these are some of the things. We have faster propagation of fire, shorter time to flash over, shorter escape times, and shorter structural collapse. So you have a perfectly accidental fire that moves very, very quickly. And I just want to talk about the nature of fire. Um, less than, you know, 5% uh, of fires originate within concealed spaces where structural wood products are located. You know, building contents such as furniture and stuff like that are most often the first items ignited and are the primary fuel source. So when these aren't suppressed by a sprinkler system or a very quick fire department response, they can eventually compromise the structural system. They're basically going to find their way into building systems. You know that you're going to have you're going to have gypsum board fall at a certain point. It's going to fail, expose the wood studs, and then the wood studs are going to get charred and then eventually, you know, fail themselves. But uh, fire professionals all agree that each fire is unique. There's no foolproof method to predict how fire will develop in a specific room and what thermal effects will develop on the surrounding structure. However, for the purposes of comparison, fire scientists have agreed upon the use of standard fire exposures developed from data derived from many fires. So you have, it's you know, well established that building contents are the primary fuel source that I talked about. That fire intensity and the rate of fire growth are influenced by the types, volume, and, and configuration of the contents. And that fire performance characteristics of a building uh, are dependent on the fire intensity and the rate of growth. Um, one thing that I really uh, was, in, was taken back by, we had a, a high-rise fire in Baltimore City. It was an older high-rise, wasn't sprinkler, burned out an entire floor. And just closing the door could save the uh, apartment. You had uh, several apartments, it, uh, they had complete burnout of every, of every apartment but one, because the occupant wasn't home and the door remained closed where other people ran out and didn't close the door behind those folks, uh, behind themselves. And the, the, the apartment on the floor where every apartment burned out, 
the 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 floor, the the apartment that didn't burn had a white sofa and it wasn't even smoke stained. It was amazing um, what closing the door does. And I know UL has that campaign about closing doors when you sleep. But I just want to talk about the combustibility and how wood burns. So as the temperature of wood increases due to fire exposure, you know, flammable vapors are produced, a char layer is formed on the exter external surface. In the presence of fire, these flammable gases, uh, vapors ignite and contribute to the fire. But as the char layer gets thicker, it insulates the remaining unburned wood and slows the rate of vapor production, thereby slowing the charring process. So wood will burn when exposed to high enough temperatures, obviously, the presence of oxygen. Thermal degradation of wood occurs in stages. And the degradation process and the exact products of thermal degradation depend upon the rate of heating as well as the temperatures. So, so wood basically will char at a predictable rate and then fail, where you have, say, steel, especially cold form steel, the light gauge stuff. Um, I, I read a report out of Pittsburgh where it's failed in a fire condition as quick as 43 minutes. And, and it really gives very little warning to failure, just kind of has a catastrophic failure. But ignition, ignition temperatures of wood, basically, if, uh, if, unless you have direct flame impingement, if you don't have direct flame impingement, you, it's about 550 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the species. Moisture content plays a big part in that, obviously. Newer wood is gonna have more moisture in it than older wood. Um, but in the presence of flame, ignition temperatures are much lower. So I do want to talk about uh, fire resistance. Uh, let's let my slide catch up with me here. The uh, questions often arise related to fire resistance characteristics of metal truss plates, protected fire assemblies, and heavy timber construction. Commonly alleged that metal plates and trusses fail by curling away from the wood due to heat and fire. Curling occurs due to tension forces pulling on the gusset plates, actually. But uh, fire resistance is typically determined by the E119 test that many of you may, may know about. Some fire uh, investigators, maybe not so much. Uh, the test protocol requires that the furnace temperatures reach 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the first five minutes and increased to 1,700 at one hour. For structural assemblies, this test has traditionally been conducted on protected assemblies and form the basis of fire resistance ratings. So it might be good for a fire investigator to see if it's a listed uh, assembly, see how it performed in 119, compare that. If you have the time, I know a lot of fire investigators, especially municipal guys, have a, you know many, many um, fires they're tasked with investigating and they can't really get into the weeds on some of this stuff. Um, uh, another location where fire rated assembly will be required, it, it, here's some right here. It, most, most residential structures don't have fire resistance rated assemblies required, but there are instances where they are required, like between dwelling units or dwellings in close proximity to the property line or between attached dwellings. Uh, another location where a fire rated assembly would be required in one and two family dwellings is between an attached garage and the dwelling uh, and uh, where the there's a living space over the garage. So you have to use that uh, type X gypsum wall board to, to get the, the there's a lot of ways to do it, but uh, most commonly they use like five eighths gypsum wall board for that. I just want to talk a little bit about the actual E119 test itself. It's, it's important to at least know the background of this. It's intended to evaluate the duration for which types of building elements contain a fire and retain structural integrity during a standardized test fire. So it's not an actual building fire. You can never really test that consistently. It's basically a, a pass-fail criteria based on peak temperatures, and, uh, and, and, you know, at, at the back of the test assembly. So the test is intended to basically just evaluate how long these things will last before they fail, uh, whether the test assembly material distorts or collapses that allows for hot 
gases to escape and whether the, there's a hose stream test, so whether they can withstand the pressure of a hose stream. So the structural capacity, I'm just going to talk about charring of wood for a little bit here. Um, the structural capacity of a wood member exposed to fire depends upon its unburned wood cross-section. In, in laboratory experiments, the char rate of wood is measured by burning a test specimen for a measured period of time. Uh, in the test, the wood specimen is exposed to radiant heat source for a chosen amount of time, and the remaining uncharred section is measured after extinguishment. The char rate is calculated by, you know, dividing the loss of the wood due to char by time. The lower char rate indicates a slower burn rate. But as a rule of thumb, uh, the average char rate is assumed to be about an inch and a half per hour. That may give some indication to fire investigators how long that fire had burned. Um, like I said, it's a rule of thumb not something to take to the bank. The moisture content of the wood significantly affects the char rate. Other factors would be the wood density, the grain, like the anatomical features, the grain direction, uh, also um, the rate of char layer formation, because it'll char less after the first inch and a half than it will um, later on. But like I said, it's just it's sort of a guide or rule of thumb, it's not so much a hard, fast thing. So like I said, uh, char rate of wood is very predictable. The method has been developed that allows heavy timber trusses to be designed to achieve a calculated, uh, not just heavy timber trusses, but heavy timber and mass timber itself to allow for a calculated fire rating. This picture is actually a picture of the cross section of a piece of cross laminated timber after a test fire. This was a five ply or five layer CLT that was burned for three hours. And it burned to the first, not even to the first bond line of the cross laminated timber. So it performed pretty well, but it's very predictable. Um, and that would lead us to our last poll question. I believe this is the last one. It is our last one. So wood exposed to fire develops an insulating char layer of char that does not impact wood degradation, speeds wood degradation, slows wood degradation, or none of the above. And I apologize for the beeping outside the window there. Of course, the instant I unmute is when the garbage truck backs up. Mm -hmm. All right, we're at about 30 seconds. This one seems like it's making people have to think a little bit, so I'll give folks another 10 seconds or so just to get their choice in. All right, we'll go ahead and close and share the results. So it looks like most folks, 90% said C. And then there were a few others that said uh, choice B, 8%, and then a few other, a handful of folks said A and D. So, Ray, you want to go ahead and talk about which one is correct? So, I guess the majority of everybody was listening because C is the correct answer. Wood exposed to fire develops an insulating char layer that slows wood degradation. So... <clears throat> I uh, just want to touch on fire movement within concealed spaces. So fire growth within concealed spaces will vary based on the volume of air, or the volume of the space, rather, air supply and the presence of fire blocking. We've already talked about fire blocking. Uh, fire can originate or extend into concealed spaces through holes in protective membranes, recessed lights, electrical boxes, ventilation openings, and other penetrations. Um, Unlike balloon frame construction, though, in the past, platform frame does provide inherent fire stops. So I've talked a lot about fire stopping and or fire blocking and draft stopping. So I just want to finish up with a little case study. If uh, any of you folks out there are from New Jersey, you might remember this fire. It was a construction site fire in Somerville, New Jersey. I actually went up and toured the uh, 
tour. I, I, I go around the country when I can, and I uh, walk uh, big construction site fires. I, I also give a class on construction site fire safety. So I go to a lot of these places. And this is one uh, area I did go. And while I was there, the New Jersey State Fire Marshals were out there investigating this fire. It was really nice to, to talk to those folks. But it was a type five four-story apartment building. So the review lights light frame wood, four-story apartment building. They determined that the fire uh, started in the attic space, which had no draft stopping because of the presence of a sprinkler system, which they didn't have turned on. So the one uh, thing that would have prevented uh, the need for draft stopping was the sprinkler system, which wasn't turned on, which is actually a recurring theme in construction site fires. Uh, pe uh, folks do not want to turn those on until the very last minute uh, when they're monitored by an alarm program. They're afraid of a broken pipe, and then nobody knows, and it's tens of thousands of dollars of water damage. Uh, the fire quickly spread uh, the length of the L-shaped building. The local fire department got there very quickly, reported the fire through the roof in 12 minutes, but it started in the, uh, in the attic, and the cause was electrical. And... Uh, I want to talk about the value of the unburned room or unburned building in fire investigation because this building was burned, but there was an identical building built right next to it. So the fire investigators, and this could even occur within a building. There were times in a building when I had an apartment fire and it was like a garden apartment and I went to the apartment upstairs or across the hall that was configured the same way just to see how it looked before it was burned. Uh, just give you an idea. So they went into the unburned building, building and they found all this orange foam substance uh, everywhere. Uh, you know, they went in and didn't really know what it was. They, they uh, imagined it was fire stop, um, but it was all over the place. So what they did was they took a piece of it into the parking lot and a fire marshal saw if it could, they could ignite it on fire. So I have a video as soon as it queues up and when they take it to the parking lot and set it on fire, I apologize for the technical issues with the videos. Um, it's kind of choppy and it's lagging, but long story short, they, uh, the thing readily burned is quote unquote fire stopping uh, caught fire and burned probably quicker than the wire insulation that it was supposed to be protecting would have burned. And uh, yeah, videos aren't doing great today. It's a shame. We, we, were, we did a, a test run on this yesterday and everything was fine. I don't know what's the deal with the internet today. It doesn't look too bad on our end, Ray. Oh, it doesn't? Okay. Well, that's good to know. On my end, uh, you see, seeing it burn and everything. Yeah, we well, got a, a good view of of it. It kind of looks like a an orange charcoal briquette. <laughs> yeah, well, you see the the dark spot next to it was another piece they burned the first time. So they did it a second time, just to make sure the first time wasn't a fluke, and they grabbed it from no, another part. So, anyway, this was labeled fire blocking foam sealant and type five residential fire block because we found uh, a, a a can of it, you know, a cylinder of it, and we looked at it and there there's the actual uh, picture from it. So I was really uh, curious what this product was and I was dismayed to find out it actually had a UL listing on it. So I contacted UL's marketing compliance section and said, hey, you know, I, I sent them the video, I sent them the pictures for this, and it's really sort of a weather stopping material, not really a fire block. It certainly wasn't meant for, uh, you know, multifamily structures. Uh, it, it really was meant for somebody's single family home but uh, UL got on them and they are uh, changing the marketing and the label and that kind of stuff. So that was one thing they noticed was you had this, uh, this, this fire 
block that really wasn't fire block. It was just as combustible as anything. The other thing that was noticed is there was a culture of uh, bad practices on this construction site. You know, here you have not only you have an open splice, which is against the code, even under even construction sites have to follow the electrical code. Uh, not only is it open splice, it is an unsupported wire open splice. So we have that bad practice there. It just shows something about a culture uh, that's not a culture of safety on this job site. Now, does this tell you in and of itself would cause that fire? No, but what it does do is it gives you an indication. It paints a picture. It certainly is compelling if you are on the stand trying to say, hey, this was an electrical fire in the attic. You, you go, well, look at the way the, the rest of the place is wired. Why wouldn't it be an electrical fire? And here you see some more examples of bad wiring, you know? And then the next uh, slide is probably my favorite. Um, it's a, a, a shot when it comes up on the screen here of how they deal with hazardous materials. Here we have a, a, a can of mineral spirits and they decide to use a paper napkin and a rubber glove as a, a cap. They lost the lid. So basically it's acting like a wick and it's sitting on OSB, combustible OSB, a temp table they made, and it's surrounded by uh, boxes. So it's not hard to, now this had nothing to do with the attic fire, but it just shows a, a broader picture and leads you to some conclusions. And uh, the conclusions in Somerville uh, that you could take from this was that they had fire spread through the addict due to an absence of draft stopping. Now that was not a code violation um, because it, they weren't required to have it because they had a sprinkler system, but the sprinkler system wasn't turned on, okay? They were using a product it was in the wrong application. Now it could have affected fire spread. It didn't in this, for instance. But you know, when you're doing an investigation, you have to look at the whole picture because you don't really know what's important until you roll it out. It's not important. So you want to collect all of this evidence. Um, the investigators used the value of the unburned room of the unburned building that was right next door, which I thought was really smart and it's a good, good tool to help you. You know, in your fire investigations you're gonna reconstruct the scene, either through uh, pictures or diagrams or floor plans, that kind of thing. And that can help with uh, it being more accurate. And there was not a culture of fire safety here. So it wasn't a surprise that this construction site caught fire. So just to kind of wrap everything up before I open it up to questions, was we went through fire investigation basics. We talked about building construction types. We uh, looked at wood construction particularly, which is most relevant to fire investigators because as I said before, the majority of structure fires in this country are one and two family dwellings. And the majority of one and two family dwellings are wood structures, either type three or type five wood structures. We looked at the residential code, which is relevant to what you just said, because we're talking about one and two family dwellings most of the time. And we looked at the fire performance of wood and even looked at a case study. So I just want to open it up to any questions. I know a question that we had in the queue earlier was, how do we know when a wood member that's been burned should be replaced? Um, uh, that's really not a question for a fire investigator, more likely a building uh, official, and I was one. But I will tell you that uh, I think anytime you see damage done to anything, whether it's, uh, we had a parking garage that caught fire, it was a cast in place parking garage, and part of the uh, ceiling or of, of the parking garage spalled because of the high heat of the fire and exposed a rebar. So we had an engineer come in or they had an engineer come in and say, okay, this is the patch that we have to put on this. Um, or if it's wood, 
or if it's structural steel, it really should be an engineer that comes in, maybe with stress gauges or whatever, and measures it. But my opinion is, if it's anything beyond surface charring, this is like surface charring, it should probably be replaced. Um, uh, but that's really a question. We used to bring the building inspectors in to make evaluations for, you know, whether to condemn a property. And, and this is also where the property maintenance code comes in. So a lot of times we had to turn off the electric or even the water uh, to a structure. So if we had to turn off the water or turn off the electrical, then that violated the property maintenance code, which says you have to have electrical service. Uh, you have to have utilities and water to occupy a house. So even if the damage wasn't that extensive, but it got to the point where we had to turn the electric off and uh, the utilities, then that was deemed unoccupiable, not because of the building code, but because of the property maintenance code. So. And Ray, I have, will I we, will chime in on that at, because um, I am an engineer and I, I agree with your assessment. If anything more than mild surface char, you're, you're you know, dealing with a compromised cross section and you know from a structural standpoint uh the the cost of evaluating each individual stud for the depth of char and performing a calculation on the residual capacity of that stud uh you know that the cost and engineering fees on on something like that probably would be negligible compared to the cost of replacing the stud e even with uh the the lumber prices being a tad higher than we've been used to historically yes absolutely so um do we have any we more have, questions we have had there? quite a few questions come in so we'll get started with those uh, the first question this is a a really good question uh, so as somebody who is a new construction fire inspector, what types of construction documents or other documentation besides permit submittals would be the most helpful for investigators? Are they, like you said, you, you, uh, you know, found the, the material there that wound up being non-compliant. Are there other things that uh, you've learned over your years that you might impart some wisdom into somebody entering the field? Well, if you're talking about construction site fires, there is supposed to be a pre-incident plan, a safety plan or a fire prevention plan, or in the IFC it's called the site safety plan that spells out uh, their safety practices. It spells out their uh, plan if something were to happen. It does things like talk, uh, talks about water supply, fire department access, uh, early notification and that kind of stuff. So I would you cer certainly go right to that plan and to see, you know, if they violated their own protocols. And two, they're supposed to record their hot work. So I would go to the hot work to see hot, hot work log or permit uh, log or however they want to document their hot work and see if hot work was performed in that area. Or, you know, uh, we had a problem for years with, uh, torch applied roof systems where you're supposed to unroll the rubber, heat it, unroll it and cut it and heat it and then apply it. But that takes more time than if you just leave it on the roll and kind of roll it out and, and you torch as it's going down. And unfortunately you got that torch, if it gets something combustible underneath of it and it co you cover it over immediately and it finds any air at all, it'll break through at three in the morning when you got a roof fire. So as construction documents go, I would say the site safety plan, the hot work permit would be the two that I would look to first. That's a great tip. All right, here's one that's, uh, this is another great question. So if we're dealing with existing buildings or historic buildings that were built uh, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Sometimes we, uh, especially on the East Coast, deal with buildings that are, you know, well over 100 years old. How do we determine and justify the, the building type, the construction type? So, you know, a building in 1920 might kind of look like a type three building, um, but, we, you know, it wasn't built because type three buildings didn't exist then. So how, how can people kind of make that determination? Well, you still can type it. I mean, it still will fit into one of those types, or it'll be a hybrid. Like for instance, podium construction, 
is considered two separate buildings. You have a type one building below a type three or a type five building above it. So you can have a hybrid building and it may not fit neatly into one of those categories, but it will fit into the category. And I always used to go to the basement to look at how, to give indications on how, how it's built. Um, Cause a lot of times the basements aren't finished or in a fire, you're going to tear out wall assemblies to look for concealed fire. So you can get a, a you know, a, um, a, a bead on it. Then I think it's probably easier to type older buildings than newer buildings because you have type five row homes that are going up that are, have brick veneer. And it would look like, Oh, that's obviously a type three because it's a brick wall, uh, but it's not, it doesn't provide any structural stability. And uh, it's really a, a light frame type five with just a brick veneer that gives you no fire resistance or structural stability at all. So I think sometimes it's harder nowadays than it would be going um, back older. I think the challenge with the older buildings is um, it's really, you know, you can, I mean, they, they were, they probably weren't built under any model code because the model codes didn't right. exist. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, a lot of uh, older uh, sort of building codes were really city ordinances that were uh, a mixed bag of laws that were different parts of the of the the code, the the you know criminal or civil code on how to build a building, and they were consolidated in a lot of places in the country uh, in the early 1900s into a building code. So that's the challenge of older buildings is just but but still, even if it's not a code violation, you can still say, well, there was no fire blocking, even though it wasn't required at the time or draft stopping or through penetrations. It wasn't required at the time, but there wasn't any. And that contributed to X, Y, or Z when it comes to fire spread or even pattern, fire patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, it, touching on that, that point you made about the, you know, the brick veneer versus uh brick uh, structural exterior walls, type three, type five construction. Some folks were asking for a clarification on that. I know we talked about it. So the the type three construction, we wanna clarify that the the brick exterior walls are, are typically load bearing masonry. And the, the type five is, is what you mentioned is the brick veneer. It looks like brick, but it's, in general, it's going to be a, a wood stud frame wall. Yeah, and, and the best way to determine that is if you're building a type three, you're going to build the exterior walls first. You know, you're going to see the masonry brick go up around it as the building goes up. And with the uh, brick veneer type five, that's usually one of the last things that happen is the brick. They built it, they build the structure. And then one of the last things they do is they, they sheathe it and um they they uh they hang the, the brick on it. yeah they yep. hang the brick and the brick is just clipped in yep. every so many courses with these metal connectors mm -hmm. uh we had some questions come in on code definitions so you talked about how the the code has their defined terms in italics uh so the there was a question uh if the the defined term in the code is different than a dictionary definition uh which one would would uh be enforceable the definition of the code yeah right it's uh, all right um and that's true for just about anything when when all else fails the the code is what's enforceable so that's uh what we lean on yeah in fact it's the opposite it's like if it's not a defined term then you use definary a uh, dictionary definition of it mm -hmm. or a common right you know understanding of a definition if it's italicized then you forget the dictionary and you have the the you know usually in chapter two of all the i codes is the definitional section mm -hmm. and uh, all right we've got time for just one or two more questions i think uh, here's a good one on sprinklers. So are, are sprinkler systems primarily meant for life safety or for building preservation? Well, not to sound like a lawyer, but it depends. If you have a 
D or 13R system, 13D stands for dwelling, 13R stands for residential, 13D is like your single family home, 13R would be like your garden apartments, they are meant for life safety. However, my good friend Shane Ray of the National Fire Sprinkler Association would tell you that even the sprinklers that are meant for primary light safety purposes will extinguish a fire in its incipient stage. And they will, usually with just one head. So it's a 13, full 13 system, NFPA 13 system, that is the system that is meant for building preservation. Now the problem with during construction is they don't turn those systems on until the building is complete. And, and sometimes even when the building is complete, they don't turn them on. Uh, in the Northeast where the weather is, is feisty, you don't want broken pipes and frozen pipes and water damage. But even where it's warm, they don't, a lot of times they don't want to turn them on until they're, it's quote unquote commissioned uh, and it's sort of handed over. So that's the issue with, with sprinklers. In LA City, I was a part of a construction fire safety roundtable where they actually mandated that that system has to be uh, put online as it goes up, as the building goes up. But they have the weather in Southern California where they can pull that off. Right. All right. I'm like... We have, we've had so many questions come in today. We're, we're not going to be able to answer them all, but thank you everyone for your questions. So I'm going to go ahead and take the screen back here and close us out. Thank you so much, Ray. That was a great presentation.